Violent and unsolved crimes can destroy families and communities, especially when witnesses are reluctant to come forward. That's a subject we talk about next on Newsnight. Good evening. This is Newsnight, and I'm Jody Miller. We're glad you're joining us. You know, violent crime tears apart the very fabric of our communities. We've seen that from a distance with the Sandy Hook Elementary School tragedy in Newtown, Connecticut. And just recently, we saw it up close here at home with a Beacon Journal story by our Newsnight colleague, Phil Trexler. In that story, Phil wrote about the 25 homicides in the city of Akron last year, 11 of which were unsolved at the start of this year. How we can change those statistics and the efforts that are being made to do just that is the topic of our news night this week. Joining me to discuss this, we welcome Mike Meyer, who is the chief of police for Copley Township, and he's also the director of Summit County Crime Stoppers. We also welcome Ed Gilbert, a respected Akron attorney and the president of the Akron Canton Barristers Association. And Phil Young, a law enforcement veteran and the city of Akron's independent police auditor. Well, I, I want to start with the premise here. And the premise is that, that too often violent crimes go unsolved because witnesses are reluctant to come forward. Why? I think that very often folks that witness crimes are just afraid that there will be retribution if they were to report that or cooperate with the police. And so very often, although folks want to help the police, and help make their community safer, they just don't feel that they can place themselves or their family in jeopardy by providing information that could help solve a crime. You know, it's one thing to hear about the need for witnesses to come forward to help solve crimes from a police officer or an officer of the court, but it's quite another thing to hear it from a family member. In this case, Cynthia Ivory, whose son Henry was gunned down on Akron streets on December 11th, 2011. Cynthia joins us now to talk about that. Cynthia, thank you very much for being with us. You're and, welcome. and our sympathies to you thank and you. to all of Henry's family and friends. I want to ask you how, how in this particular case, with the murder of your son, witnesses have let you down. Well, because um, the witnesses have let us down because those people are still out here. And by no one cooperating with the police, these same old people is going to keep killing somebody. And they're out here, and a lot of people know who did it, but they won't come for it. But I'm asking you, it would be so gracious and so kind if someone, if you know anything, you can remain anonymously, but please contact the police department if you know anything. Every bit of evidence is valuable. and. If we don't have witnesses that come forward with that information, it's hard to uh, prosecute, it's hard to make an arrest. So it's very important that even if you think that something isn't important, that you contact the police agency that's involved and tell them what you know or who you heard it from. Uh, and, and I think that the more information we get, the easier it is uh, for these cr crimes to be solved. Well, and it's not just solving a crime and, and, and arresting an individual. It's, it's a, a case of getting the witnesses, obviously, to go into the courtroom and to testify so that you can get convictions, correct? Ed? Yes, I mean, that's where I come from uh, in the sense that uh, uh, my uh, group, um, Akron Kent Barristers, is a uh, group of um, 75 African-American lawyers in the Akron Kent community, and we've been really incensed by the number of cases that have to be dismissed as a result of people not coming forward. And that's why we have gotten involved into the, uh, this um, witness protection uh, uh, forum uh, that we started in September. Well, I, I want to delve a little bit more into why it is that witnesses are reluctant to come forward. And, and you, you referenced it at, at first, Mike, because they're, they're worried about endangering themselves or their families? Sometimes folks would come forward if they knew that all they had to do was provide information to the police and would not be called upon to testify. 
but I think there's that fear that if they do work with the police that absolutely they'll have to testify and they don't want to put themselves in that position of being identified as being the one who provided information to the police. And it isn't always the case. Sometimes they can just help the police solve the crime and they can remain anonymous. There is a reward out uh, on Crime Stoppers. Yes. A $2,000 reward for witnesses to come forward to, to help uh, solve this crime. And, and they can remain anonymous, correct? Yes. Why is it important, in your estimation, for the larger community to understand the need for people to come forward? It, it doesn't really help anything by people with this no-snitch law, by not coming forth. It doesn't help at all. It's hard for the police department to and the detectives to solve the crimes because of people not coming forth, because of the no snitch law, the street law. And that's not helping anyone by all means. And I don't wish this on anyone whatsoever to ever go through this situation that I'm going through. And it's hard enough that Henry's gone and it's even harder that the people are still out here, still walking around here who get a chance to see their loved ones, to get a chance to say that they love them, and I don't get a chance to say that to my son. Is, is the, the ability of a witness to come forward, is that, is that uh, a neighborhood problem, uh, a police problem, uh, a, a community problem? You know, is it, is it whether it's in the urban, you know, an urban neighborhood, whether it's a suburban neighborhood, is it just the inability of people to come forward and help, help the police? Well, I think it's all of the above. Uh, and, and we're not talking about just violent crimes. It's hard to get witnesses to come forward for something as simple as a traffic crash, you know, that where you might witness that. We have to look at all the variables that are there. Can they get off work to go to court to testify? Where do they park when they get there? You know, how much is this going to cost them? Is this going to cost them a day's pay? Uh, are the police going to release their information? There's a lot of fears that citizens have that, you know, prevent them from wanting to get involved. So how do we change this, this culture of silence and the whole no snitch to, to a willingness to come forward and, and to help solve crimes? Uh, you know, as a citizen, you, if you see something, know something, speak up. And um, uh, I think we have to uh, make it uh, attractive to them. For example, money, if you will. Uh, and um, I, I understand Crime Stoppers and the Chief can speak to this more directly, does have a, a system where we'll pay people for tips. And we have to uh, kind of do that. But at the same token, it seems to me that we have to start from the younger uh, generation. And uh, just like uh, you have situations with uh, uh, don't drink and drive. In that same type of vein, we have to say if you see something, know something, as a citizen, you should speak up. And I think that's the basis of what we have to really look at, uh, change that whole culture of silence. You know, is, 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 it, is it reaching out to the neighborhoods? Is it reaching out to families? Is it reaching out through the schools? How, how do we get to change that culture of silence to help the police solve crimes? I think in one regard, most police departments now are more engaged in community-oriented policing, which means we're making more of an effort to be connected with our community, putting officers back on footbeats, putting officers back in situations where they have first-hand contact with folks on a daily basis, not just with folks when they've called because they've been involved in a problem, or not just with folks that are suspects, but where officers are in contact on a daily basis with folks in the community, the community that we serve. And when we know the folks in our community more directly, they are more willing to come with us with information to help us solve crimes, in part because they know that we're working with them to help keep their neighborhood safe, and also in part because they would come to trust the police that when the police say, we will not identify you, just give us the information that we need to help set us in the right direction, that they feel comfortable in knowing that the police are not going to identify them. Can you do that? Can you tell a witness, you know, we're not going to need you in court and, and, and then hope to get a, a, a conviction? Well, obviously, if somebody's a witness to a crime, and particularly witnesses something very significant, significant portion of that crime, we would like to have them come forward and serve as a witness because we may need them to make a conviction. We may need them to testify. Mm -hmm. However, there are a lot of times when crimes occur in neighborhoods 
where the police have a lot of physical evidence they could connect the suspect to that crime. They just need somebody to give the police a name of who that suspect is or where that suspect can be located. And that type of information can be shared confidentially with the police to help the police connect with the suspect, and they wouldn't always be needed to testify under those circumstances. Okay. Ed, are you finding that to be the case in, in let's say, the, the, the Akron area where we've got those 11 unsolved crimes? Yeah. Well, you, you know, uh, speaking as, as a lawyer, I mean, you, you, there's no question about it. I mean, you have to have that connection between the quote-unquote person that um, uh, pro provides anonymous information and then connect up to the person that actually goes in the courtroom. I mean, if you don't have a witness sitting on the stand, you forget it, you know, and that's basically where we are now is that we have to have that connect up. But what we found is that we have to really uh, tell people and they have to be assured that the, the first tip is going to be anonymous and they're not going to be hassled by the police, they're not going to be um, uh, their name is not going to be distributed all over the place. And once you get to that, ne that first step, it, I think it's a little simpler to get to the next one. But everybody has to be on board on this. And when I say that, I'm talking about even the judges. And we're finding the judges uh, in uh, the felony courts are becoming more sensitive to that, uh, taking the, uh, the uh, phones out of the courtroom, for example giving witnesses a little extra time to do certain things, uh, uh, clearing the courtroom sometimes, you know, when you have a sensitive witness and so forth. But we have to get everyone on board to this, and, and because word gets around very quickly that, you know, if I'm going to be a witness, I'm going to be hassled, and, you know, I'm not going to be respected. They're going to say certain things in the courtroom. They're going to do certain things, and we have to all be on board to uh, help witnesses be more uh, comfortable. Is it a cultural thing? particularly, let's say, in the black community where, where you would not be respected if, in fact, you come forward as a witness for a crime? Yes, I think it is, and um, it, it's sad, but we have to uh, deal with that. We're working with a number of the younger people who have really good ideas. For example, um, if uh, some of them said, uh, you know, why not get the uh, football coach involved? Uh, uh, suggesting to some of the kids that they, sh they hear something, they should say something. Why not have a, a, a dance on uh, witness protection uh, uh, to get that out in the community more? Why not have the basketball team, football team support that and so forth? Those are some, uh, it seems like little things, but they're very important to get down into this culture of silence. Okay. Are you finding that to be the case, Phil? That and also, we have people that are afraid to come forward uh, for different reasons. Sometimes they have a warrant for their own arrest, uh, and then sometimes they feel that maybe in the past they haven't been treated, uh, I guess, in a really good way by the police. Uh, and those are things that can be overcome. Those are easy fixes. We have to develop relationships. And when I say we, I mean our police officers and the community have to develop relationships of trust. Uh, even if it's just one officer, you'll find that people will call that officer and give them information, even if that's just a patrol officer or a traffic officer. It's someone that they know and they can trust. So if we build up those relationships, I think it makes it a lot easier. Well, I want to remind our viewers that, that more information will be on our website at Newsnight.net, including Phil Trexler's story, which kind of prompted this entire program. That's Newsnight.net. For more Newsnight content, including extended discussions, full interviews, and the chance to speak your mind about the issues, join us online at Newsnight.net. We're continuing our discussion with uh, Police Chief Mike Meyer, Ed Gilbert, and Phil Young. And Phil, I want to come back to you and, and ask you, how, how do you go about building the kinds of relationships you were talking about between a policeman and a neighborhood or a community? Well, I think everyone has to work together. Uh, it's not the police department to reach out. It's not the community to reach in. But I think there has to be a little give and take on both sides. There are some that feel that the police department's on this side and the community's on this side and we need to build a bridge. And I don't believe that. I believe that our community, the police department is part of our community. And I think that 
we all need to work together. Uh, officers need to make themselves approachable, uh, available to citizens. Uh, to stop and have conversations so that people in neighborhoods get to know who they are uh, and how they can help them and what they can do and not just drive by. And I'm sure we have a lot of officers out there that are now uh, actually doing that, trying to make friends in the community. And that's very, very important because we can't go anywhere until we have the trust of the community and the police department also trusting the community. Well, I know, Mike, you are the director of Crime Stoppers. So, it's, so explain to our viewers, how does that work? Well, Crime Stoppers is a reward program that was established in Summit County a few years ago. It's, there are two components to it. One is that folks can call in anonymously and provide tips that help the police solve crimes. Mm -hmm. And then they can receive a reward, and that reward can be paid anonymously as well. So it provides a secure phone line for folks to call in. And the phone number is 330-434-COPS, C-O-P-S. So if folks do witness a crime in their neighborhood and they would like to provide information to the police, if they call that number, they can remain anonymous, provide that information that can help police solve the crime. The dispatcher on the other end will assign them a unique number just for them, mm -hmm. and they can call back in with that unique number at a later date. And if there is a reward, then we can pay that reward to them anonymously anonymously and we'll never know who they are and they won't be called to testify. Okay, so that would really I think encourage people to to help the police solve these crimes. That's our hope. Okay. Yes. Ed, you are very involved in an organization that's called um, uh, Community Witness Forums. Yes. Uh, and this is just, it's a new organization. Explain what that does. Well, uh, that organization is uh, uh, we started in September of 2012, and uh, we are trying to identify uh, why um, people are not coming forward, why witnesses are not coming forward, and why we have to dismiss so many cases because we do not have the witness backup. And uh, we have asked uh, a panel of, um, of people, such as uh, Sherry Bevan Welsh has been involved in that. Uh, um, Phil Young here has been involved. And we have NAACP, uh, Marco Somerville from the uh, council has been involved. And uh, we had a uh, forum uh, on September 15th I, trying to identify what the problem was. Mm -hmm. And uh, amazingly enough, uh, uh, most of the people in that forum uh, uh, were un uninformed. They did not know that uh, Crime Stoppers of Summit County, for example, was alive and well. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone thought that, even some of the police thought that uh, Crime Stoppers was not active in our community. So um, uh, we invited the block club presidents to that uh, event, and we have the next one coming up on uh, quarterly in, in, in um, um, this month, January 26th. And um, the purpose of that is identify what the problem is and try to solve it. And right now we've been able to identify that indeed Crime Stoppers is, is there, it's alive and well, that it's available for our citizens, and that word has to get out. And then the next step will be uh, how we can protect our people that come in as witnesses. Uh, Sherry Bevan Welsh has some really great ideas on that. We're going to be moving forward in that direction. And um, it, it is an um, invitation-only type of situation dealing with individuals that have a, a firm interest in that uh, topic, individuals that have uh, uh, some uh, a background in that area so that we can uh, uh, make some progress. So that's basically what it's about. At one point in, in Phil's story, I was very um, touched by something that you said with respect to witnesses coming forward, Ed. Yeah. And it was it had to do with the fact that it, it's not just solving crimes, but it's the fact that if these people go, you know, uh, without being caught, it endangers the entire community, correct? Exactly. And, you know, it, it's sad. And, and we um, uh, number the uh, lawyers, and I, I get it from both sides because in our group, uh, the Akron Barristers, we have... Uh, assistant prosecutors, mm -hmm. we have defense counsel, and we all want to see that justice is done. And when these cases are dismissed because, uh, you know, we don't have people coming forward, that endangers our whole community, and it really set, sets a bad example, and uh, mm -hmm. particularly for young people. Mm -hmm. And um, we're very concerned about that, and we want to see justice done. 
Mike, you're a suburban police chief. You know, is this a, a situation and a problem that you find happens in suburbia, not just not just in the the urban areas? Well, although I'm a suburban police chief, I formerly worked in an urban area in Cuyahoga County for many years. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a problem that's all over the place, not just in the inner city, but in the suburbs. I think sometimes it's more uh, the problem is greater in the inner cities, sometimes because you have a lot of folks living very close to each other, for example, in apartment complexes. So when a crime is committed, they live very close to the persons that have committed those crimes, and they don't feel safe with the suspects living nearby, as opposed in the suburbs sometimes where somebody might arrive and they see somebody that they don't recognize and they report a license plate number. So when crime occurs, very often it occurs in the same neighborhood in which the suspects and the victims all live together. And so I think that makes it kind of uncomfortable for those folks that have witnessed something. Okay. We've heard recently an awful lot of discussion about gun violence, and I'm curious how much, uh, how much of a role guns play in, in violent crimes. Phil? I think that plays a very big role because most of these violent crimes involve weapons, and usually they're weapons that haven't been obtained legally. Uh, so when we have those crimes, you know, we have to look at weapons, and, and, and that's a very big issue. And, you know, our police department, uh, they have anonymous tip lines. I have an anonymous tip line. Uh, the detective bureau is more than happy to take any tips that you wanted to give them at 330-375-2490. And if someone feels that they can't call the police department or afraid to call the police department, call me and I will make that connection for them. If they feel that maybe they haven't been treated good in the past or they don't know how they're going to be treated, you know, I can intervene in that and maybe help that process to be a little better. Mm -hmm. Jody, I would like to say that although crimes are very often are used in violent crimes, there are a lot of law-abiding folks that own firearms and they keep those in their homes for their protection. And one thing that's interesting to note is because we can own firearms in our society, there are a lot of folks that will not break into your home at night when you're in bed asleep because they know if you're home, they don't know if you own a gun, but you have the right to own a gun, and they don't want to face that. So very often burglars, which are violent criminals, will go to great lengths to break into folks' homes in the daytime when they're away at work or away at school, and they know that nobody's there. And they go to great lengths to make sure that nobody's there. So the discussion on firearms is a very complicated one that deserves extensive discussion among folks. Right. Right, absolutely. Um, there's another aspect of, in, in particular, that I've, I've heard about recently, and that is gangs. What, what role do gangs maybe play in, in the, the kind of crimes that are not being solved at this point? You know, gangs are really a very difficult situation because, uh, you know, when I was growing up, we would just have just little block, little situations where kids would would fight and that type of thing and that would be it but now uh, gangs are a little more complicated you know and uh, uh, it is a and I understand we do have a gang unit in Akron uh, uh, but um, uh, I, I have to turn the fill on that one because I, I'm really not involved in really how they really operate in the city. Do they intimidate witnesses sometimes Phil? The gang unit? Mm -hmm. or Not the gang, but, but gangs themselves. If, if gangs are out there committing crimes, are they, are they very influential in, in stopping witnesses from coming forward? I've heard that some of them are. Uh, they're very uh, influential in keeping people from coming forward or uh, being uh, so violent that maybe someone would say, well, I'm not going to say anything because he's a gang member or she's a gang member or whatever, so that, that plays a big part in it. But, you know, when we're talking about gangs, again, as the chief said about guns, that's a very extensive argument that you can make from a lot of different areas. And sometimes you've got a, a bunch of kids that are hanging out together that may not be a gang, but it might be a group of kids that could be just as dangerous as a known gang. Gang seems like it's a loose term because uh, it, it may not be always that organized exactly. to be quote unquote a gang. You know, what kind of partnerships can the three of you uh, maybe reach out to to help to get this message out to the community? Well, first of all, from me, from the police standpoint, uh, the most important relationship or partnership is between our police officers and our communities. 
just as we were talking about here, gangs. I mean, gangs is an all-encompassing term. And very often you can have in groups of gangs some kids that are very violent and some that aren't so violent. And as a police officer, when I worked on the street, I was able to make or establish relationships with kids and gangs. And there were some that would come to me on the side and tell me about other gang members. Okay. Because deep down, they really weren't that bad of kids. Mm -hmm. They were hanging with some bad kids, but they weren't that bad. And they didn't care for some of the things that they saw. So from the police stand, uh, side, establishing relationships with the community is very, very significant for us with all folks, gang members, folks in the community, so that there's kind of a common trust between us. Mm -hmm. But we also establish relationships we have here between professions, between the lawyers and the police and the city officials to try to address the problem because this affects all of our neighborhoods and our entire community. In the past, we have not been sort of... Uh, partners or sort of like we've been more like adversaries with the police and, 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 and that's not good. We have to get more involved with the, the basic aspect of what's going on here. And despite the fact that we're defense counsels, prosecutors, whatever, we have to see that justice is done. And so the lawyers that's a little different from what we've been doing in the past. We've been kind of standoffish but now that partnership hopefully will be growing uh, a little closer and we need to do a lot more and, and my organization is identifying that and, and we want to do a little bit more to get a little closer to the police department and uh, the different groups so that we can, because we hear it from the other ang angle. Sure, you know. exactly. And, and the police have been standoffish with attorneys as well. Yeah. But at the end of the day we yeah. really want the same thing. Right. We want safe communities. We want safe neighborhoods for folks to go to school, to work, and to live. So at the end of the day, we have the same interests. Uh, basically, the old saying that all that's addressed can't be changed, but nothing can be changed unless we address it. So I think the three of us just addressing this has meant a lot. We've all learned a lot. Uh, we've had several meetings with each other and uh, just six, seven people, and we've learned different things. Uh, our first meeting, we didn't know anything about Crime Stoppers, and we called Chief Meyer in, and we met, I think there was seven or eight of us, and we couldn't believe what we learned about Crime Stoppers. So I, I think the more we learn from each other, the more we can pass on to the community. So I think that's what uh, our, our main focus is between the three of us. Uh, I think we've developed a partnership now, and I think that it it, it has to go up just from the dialogue and, and what we've learned. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank the three of you for not only being here, but for the efforts that you're making to stop crime in our communities. And thank you for being here. And thank you for joining us on Newsnight.